Welcome back to the Chess for Life Spotlight. I'm your host, Elliot Neff, National Master and founder of Chess for Life. I'm excited to have our guest today, Ashley Priori. And Ashley has an amazing story of playing chess, competing in chess, and using the game of chess as a vehicle in both impacting youth and into her career, her studies, and the many, many organizations that she is supporting and even founded. She's founded multiple nonprofits, started her first one at age 14, if I've got that right, <laughs> and in fact, founded a nonprofit called The Queen's Gambit long before there was ever the Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. So there is so much to talk about here, but welcome to the Chess for Life Spotlight, Ashley. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to have you on. I remember visiting you in Pittsburgh. And on my way back from the Chess Olympiad in Batumi, Georgia, after coaching the Ugandan team out there and Fiona Matassi from the Queen's Gambit and some of those things, and it was so cool to drop in, see some of the work you're doing. But to get started, can we just go back a little bit here to let our audience get to know you a bit? So, you know, where are you from? What are you focused on at this stage in your life? And let's just start right there. Yeah, that sounds great. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. I was born and raised here. Um, and what I love about Pittsburgh is that it has such a rich chess history. I mean, we have the Pittsburgh Chess Club that's been around for years, um, founded by Andrew Carnegie Steelworkers. So wow. chess is really engraved in the city's history. And, and that's something that I love about it. Um, you know, when I was really little, my brothers did competitive chess with um, a local teacher here and local master, Jerry Myers. And he really created this whole platform for young people in scholastic chess. I mean, he really started and paved the way for that. And it was so great for, you know, my brothers and my sister and I enjoyed it. And we learned so much from Mr. Myers and he continues to be a, a role model for me, but it was so difficult when you are a young woman in that space, because, you know, I, we would go to tournaments, there'd probably be like 300 people there. And my sister and I would probably be the only girls there. Wow. So, um, and I also think of it this way too. Like I imagine if I weren't the sibling of two boys who were amazing at chess and had always ranked in like the top five of tournaments, I think I would have had an even more difficult time because people just knew me as, you know, the little sister. So there mm -hmm. was some familiarity there but you know that that definitely was part of my childhood that stood through and and I love Pittsburgh and remembering you know all of those things with scholastic youth um I just graduated from Pitt so University of Pittsburgh um I think when you and I first, oh thank you I think when you and I first met I was a senior in high school I believe so I that's believe that's correct and I think you were about to transition into university Yes, yes. So it was it was definitely a um, a unique time, but you know I uh, majored in English and political science. So it was definitely interesting being a chess player and having those two majors because everyone assumed that you would go into math, um, <laughs> which is something that I I didn't necessarily love to do. Um, and uh, in the fall, I'll be starting at um, George Washington University for uh, public administration. That's awesome. Well, thank you for that background, Ashley. And congrats again on now graduating university there and moving on to the next phase of your life. So there is so much we could get into here. Let's just go for a moment on what you mentioned about the challenge of being a young girl getting into chess. And there's almost no girls, at least at the time, involved. So can you talk about that challenge a bit more, how you overcame it and what you've done over the years to help that issue? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has gotten better and I see initiatives that U.S. Chess is doing now and it's, and it's wonderful, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. they're, you know, uh, starting to have more girl focused chess clubs and, and everything, but there's still so much that we need to do. And I always go back to whenever there would be a tournament, um, my sister and I would always get a top girl trophy. And looking back, it would be sort of funny because we would be the only girls there. So 
Mr. Myers would switch between giving it to my sister and I. <laughs> so we go back and forth, back and forth. So we have like a stack of them um, wow. at our at our house. And so um, I just laugh at that because I mean, thinking about always assuming and going that you know, you know you're leaving the tournament, you're going to get some sort of trophy, top girl trophy. Um, but the trophy was often pink, um, and so there's a lot of these stereotypes assumptions around it you know what girls like and and all of that and so that was that was definitely a struggle mm. you know I would say that you know yeah. can I can I interrupt you here one sec yeah. you know so you experienced that and those things of like top girl trophy and you mentioned the stereotypes and such looking back would you say that even trophies like that helped or maybe even hindered yeah, you know, I would say they, they, the first couple of times, they certainly helped because when you're at the tournament for the first time, you want to get comfortable. It's nice mm -hmm. feeling that way. But mm -hmm. as it went on, I think that it, it hindered it because it would almost feel like you were being praised just for being a girl and uh, being, uh, yep. And that was so difficult. And my sister and I were fortunate that we would win other types of trophies. So to us, it just yep. didn't seem fair that we would still get a top girl trophy if, you know, we were winning other trophies. It just, it just seemed almost like a, um, like a badge or, or an honor that would just be thrown at you. And it would shine the spotlight on us because it would say, oh, yeah girl is winning a girl trophy and there's no right. top four trophy. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So maybe what I'm hearing you say there is while that was an encouragement early on, maybe there's a different way. Could you have that encouragement just for anybody who's playing their first events that feels that encouragement? And we've done a little bit of that at Chess for Life where we like to say that when you compete in your first over the board in-person tournament, no matter your result, if you finish the event, you have earned at least a medal. Yes. I'm not a participant award type of person, right? I think you need to put effort and achievement. But what an amazing accomplishment to go through the potential pain <laughs> of losing games and not giving up, right? Exactly. So would you say that that kind of an approach might be a step up from having like a top girl award just where anybody who's competing in their first event or two or something earns something and then beyond that now you're into the next category now you've got to score in your top groups let's say mm -hmm. absolutely i think that helps i mean they used to give out like top unrated or they would have ribbons right. if it were you know your first tournament i think that right. helps but i also think that if you give opportunities for new students to experience other elements of chess within a tournament, it can be a great experience. Like if you have speakers yes. or grandmasters who they can meet, people that look like them, um, you know, whenever yes. Mr. Myers would bring in a female grandmaster or top player, like you would just feel so much better because you're like, oh, there's someone who looks like me there. So incorporating right. that I think is important because I'm always, I've always been, um, proponent for like holistic chess mm -hmm. approaches, right? So if you're not super competitive or a super competitive kid, you can still go to tournaments, experience it, but get something else out of it, like mm -hmm. meeting people or um, going into that next category, like you like you said, because sometimes it's that tiny accomplishment that just makes the kid feel like, oh yeah, I want to keep going with this. Yeah, awesome. So when you started out, almost zero other girls involved right? What do you see now? So it has certainly has gotten better as I sort of ended um, more of the scholastic competitive things I was doing. There had certainly been more young girls um, competing, but it got to the point where I was in high school. And uh, when I would start to go out and teach at locations, no girls would, would sign up. And mm -hmm. you would think maybe that if it's a female teacher, right? that they would sign up, but I found that it always had to do with assumptions at home. So I would have mm -hmm. students who had, you know, they were, it was brother and a sister, the brother would sign up for chess and the parent would say, oh, you know, yeah, we taught him, we haven't taught our daughter, we just don't mm -hmm. think there's, you know, enough interest. 
in fact, there was interest, but there were these assumptions around it. So that's why I like bringing in parents and guardians and talking with them a little bit about the assumptions first. I think that's important. Share what you're doing and say, hey, it's not just about chess. I mean, we're teaching other elements of the game too, but, you know, incorporate all everyone, have everyone have a seat at the table, I think is really important. So when I was going to classes, I started to encourage more girls sign up and more girls did. Um, And a lot of the focus of our work at Queen's Gambit is women and girls in chess, creating spaces where they feel empowered, Mm -hmm. but also focusing on that, you know, you don't just have to go into competitive chess. You certainly can, but it's about the skills that you learn, which is what, you know, chess for life's about as well. It's you're gaining the skill set that you need to excel in critical thinking and problem solving. Absolutely. Exactly. And I love that. And there's so much more we can dive into. Maybe we'll come back to yes. some of these pieces, you know, with the progress, especially and I'll mention even right now, what US Chess you alluded to earlier has done with things like the girls club at nationals, right? These amazing spaces where it it's not that trophy for being a girl in the tournament. But it's now while you're at this event, you can meet other amazing women in chess and have this space where you can be with your friends and with others like you. So you can feel part of that community. And I've, it's been awesome to see that, that grow. So we may come back to this if we have time a little bit later on. But what you mentioned right there was about the aspect of chess and skills paralleled into life, which is, of course, what Chess for Life stands for, teaching life skills through the game. And what you have been so passionate about doing is transferable skills, skills Mm -hmm. that can help you further in so many areas. So let's dive into that a bit. Mm -hmm. What have you seen as some of the top skills that chess can help develop? Mm -hmm. No, it's so interesting. So recently, our board at Queen's Gambit, we were talking about, you know, marketing for chess and you know, how do we talk about the game when people might not have played it? What are their Mm -hmm. assumptions about the game? And everyone says, oh, it's a strategic game, but it gets Mm -hmm. it to like, okay, well, what does strategic mean? What is strategy? Like, how are we defining those? Mm -hmm. And recently we created, um, which we'll um, release soon. It's like a profile of a chess player. And so Mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, chess players are empathetic. They understand how to look at both sides of a situation and mm-hmm. understand the, the consequences of both sides. Um, they can problem solve. It's not just, mm-hmm. you know, looking for one answer. It's finding multiple things that you could do. Because, I mean, in life, you're not just going to make, like, you know, one, one choice. You're going to make multiple decisions and juggle all of those. Um, I'd also say that, you know, when we talk about strategy, I think it's important to define it as strategic leadership, which is what, Mm. you know, Queen's Gambit has evolved into. Originally, we said, you know, we're teaching 21st century skills, but Mm -hmm. as learning has evolved more and there's more initiatives around, you know, civic engagement, social impact, um, for us, strategic leadership is this idea that leaders, people doing all this work in the community, need to know what's going to happen four to five years from now. And that's what chess is about. I mean, you're not going to win a game if you don't think ahead. Yep. So we, we shift it to strategic leadership. And, you know, my hope is that people will challenge themselves with defining those terms. I mean, when you say chess is strategic, well, what does that mean? Chess right. teaches critical thinking. Right. What types of critical thinking are important? It's being more specific. And I think that's how people get it, get what the game's impact is. Yes, that's awesome. I love that phrase, strategic leadership. I really do because of that aspect. It's easy to sometimes have a stereotype about chess and chess players and what chess is. It's like this brainy strategy, problem solving, that's it. But but no, it's how do you bring all these pieces together how do you apply these skills together? And what it really alludes to is the softer skills. I take it also, right? If you're working with a team and you've got all these different individuals with their unique abilities, how are you going to bring them together into a cohesive plan? Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. So 
I love that. Uh, so let's move forward a little bit more, but we jumped right into it. And let's, let's let our audience get to know you personally a little bit more, if you don't mind. So what is something that most people don't know about you? You know, this is, I, I always think about this, this question and um, cause when I get asked it a lot and um, people assume that because I am a chess player, um, you know, there are other games that mm -hmm. I'm super passionate about. So they're like, oh, you must be into checkers or card games or Monopoly. They list tons of things off. And Again, I'm some I stereotypes, love, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I love talking about how, you know, games in general are really good for, for development. Yep. But something people might know is that I've never played checkers before in my life. And I'm horrible at other card games. Um, the only thing that I love, and I love that you have the NFL, uh, the football behind you is yep. I'm a big football fan, um, mostly awesome. because I see that connection that players have to have. And I think that um, yep. when players know chess, they're yep. better on the field. We can see some correlation there. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I'm terrible at, at other games and it's somewhat of a joke because my kids always assume that I know checkers and I'm like, I've never played it and I probably never will. <laughs> That's really awesome. And yes, thanks for mentioning. And yes, that football's autographed by Russell Wilson. Um, had a fun event with him one time. And I've got another one here, which could be another story. But there are so many pro sports players who value the game of chess also for what it does for their thinking, their strategizing. And like you said earlier, it's critical in strategy and chess in life to be thinking multiple steps ahead to be going, hey, that's almost like a baseline skill, honestly. If you don't have the ability to think deeply and think critically and think carefully about the consequences of choices, then what are you doing, right? You're, you're playing one move chess. And that's that could be why we have so many challenges in our world today. How many people are making short-term decisions mm -hmm. instead of long-term thinking? Anyway, I could go down that rabbit trail for a really <laughs> long time, and I'm sure you, you could do. Uh, so let's get back to this. Um, what is something that you're great at doing that just comes naturally to you? We like to talk about, you know, the unique abilities of pieces and, and these strengths, and we talk about building teams around strengths. What's something that just comes naturally to you mm -hmm. that you're really great at doing? Mm -hmm. No, I love that question because I often have my students think about that as well, since they mm -hmm. always talk about their, you know, the chess skills, yeah. you know, you talk about like, well, a knight is great because it can move this way. It's the only piece that can jump, you know, X, yeah. Y, and Z. But what chess actually provided me with was this ability to make connections that you might not necessarily make and also mm -hmm. to be able to pitch those connections. So one thing I'm great at is, you know, the, the public speaking element or just speaking in general, because mm -hmm. I always have, you know, my chess students say if they have this move that they want to do, even if it's like the most wackiest move ever, I want them to say, you know, why are you moving there? What's the point? And can you talk, talk it through and prove it to me? And if they can at least do that, then mm -hmm. I feel better about them moving somewhere because they have a reason behind why they're doing yeah. it. And so I love to do, you know, public speaking or talking. And I think it's a skill that everyone needs to have because you could have mm -hmm. a great idea, yep. but you're not able to, to pitch if it. If you can't communicate it, it's going to join the graveyard of great ideas. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I find chess players are pretty good at, at, at speaking and that, like looking at but you, I mean, you've done tons of talks, right? And it's just something that you're able to, you're, you're able to go off the, like I'm going to just talk about the importance of chess. You know, I so love that you mentioned this aspect because it is rarely discussed or, or linked to how chess can help with public speaking, right? When do you hear that talked about the benefits right. of chess, Never. <laughs> <laughs> right? And yet now that you bring it up, part of my own story was I was an extremely shy kid, mm -hmm. right? I could hardly talk to anybody. And yet I remember that as a young chess player, I was asked to take a leadership role in a chess club and do announcements like here's the rules and explain the rules and do these things. And guess what? That put me on a place where I could take a strength of mine, a unique ability of mine, 
which created a bit of a safe space because I was an expert in it, and then project that in a public arena to adults, kids, and others, and that built the skill, right? And mm -hmm. so it's a competency. I love how you said too, it's a skill that everybody needs to have. Mm -hmm. I would agree that in our, in our day and age, and I'm going down this tangent for a second here, but we think about how the world is changing through uh, robotics and AI and how jobs are becoming obsolete or automated and, and how dramatically it's shifting our world. What do we need more of? Don't we need more of this ability to communicate, collaborate, mm -hmm. understand, empathize, right? These EQ skill, skills, not just the IQ. Mm -hmm, exactly. And, you know, one other thing too, to add is that when we talked earlier about, you know, women and girls in chess, think about leadership positions. I mean, in mm -hmm. chess in general, looking at clubs, even looking at executive boards, it continues mm -hmm. to be male led. Mm -hmm. And when you look at different leadership positions across the country, it's still male led, it's getting better. But mm -hmm. um, part of that is there is these discussions about opportunities that women have to speak and how there's like mansplaining and all these things. And so it's really interesting when we think about chess, there's that connection where women are often shut out of the game. Women are often shut out of speaking opportunities or leadership opportunities. And how can we use chess and actually create spaces so women have the opportunity to feel empowered and then they can go into those positions, feel like they can speak you know, freely and, and all of that. Right, because in many ways, wouldn't you say that it's not a matter of innate abilities whatsoever? Mm -hmm. Is it more just a matter of the path and the opportunities, the mm -hmm. lack thereof? Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, lo even looking at, you know, my friends who are part of leadership positions in different chess clubs, um, their journey as women getting there was so different than demands and they had to go women had to go through all of these hurdles to prove themselves right and so i i th always like to mention that because i think when we look at the skills that chess teaches mm -hmm. and how for how long chess was a male dominated game and to somewhat mm -hmm. still continues to be you know we can make some connections between barriers and, and gender equity hmm. wow so let's uh step back a little bit further now <laughs> so you started playing chess around what age would you say I was about four. Wow. Okay. Age four. And you started playing in tournaments uh, roughly around when? It was around the same time. I would say the first like big wow. competitive tournament was five or six. Wow. That's amazing. Right. A lot of people don't think of chess players competing in tournaments at that age, let alone playing. Right. <laughs> and then at what age did you start coaching others? Because you've coached students now for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I, the first um, student I had, I was about 10 years old um, and I was, when I was doing it, but actually looking back even further, when I was eight, I did teach a little bit at a local library. Um, and it's a, it's a funny story because I just was so insistent on teaching that class um, that I, I made it happen. I was, old, I was really little, but I, I presented myself as, as older. Um, but 10 is, I always say, is when I feel like I actually had a group of almost like clients or students that would come and want to want to learn. Um, and I always say kids can do it at, at, at a young age because Queen's Gambit, we have youth instructors because I'm a big proponent of, you know, people that look like you need to need to help be teaching. Right. You need to share those share those connections. Wow, that's awesome. And so you started coaching others at age 10 age 14, you founded your first nonprofit. Can you share a little bit more of how that came about and what inspired you and what gave you the confidence to do so? Mm -hmm. yeah, so again, I mean, it was, it really was a journey of understanding the environment of nonprofits in the chess community. I was so tired of being in spaces and rooms that continued to be male dominated. And when I would see young girls not want to go into classes because they didn't see people like them, I knew that there needed to be a group that was yeah. focused on empowering students who didn't have the resources to yeah. take chess classes. I mean, yeah. 
you know, chess in itself can be expensive, right? If you tack on private classes, you know, full on classes, it, it adds up. And, you know, there's something to be said about groups that are trying to, you know, teach in a way where the kids really don't have to, to, to pay that much or mm -hmm. their sponsorships, other, other opportunities. And so I started just by teaching at different locations and it came this point where in order to make a bigger impact, we needed to have other sources of, of funding. So I did a lot of research and, you know, the nonprofit side I thought was, was going to be the best sort of way to go because Pittsburgh's full of nonprofits and, mm -hmm you know, foundations. And so there seemed to be a really good connection there. Nice. Um, I also talked with, you know, my, my former chess coach, Mr. Myers, and he said, one of the things that, you know, he regrets about his whole chess teaching journey was that he never started a nonprofit. Mm. Um, so that I always thought was really interesting. And so mm. uh, I, I connected with tons of different people in the community, did a lot of outreach, and it, it really came together. I wouldn't say it was, I had the confidence yet to do it. I would say it was more that I had the skills that partly because of chess that were, you know, attention to detail, understanding that the actions that I take now are going to have impact later on. Um, very much focused on, you know, creating a solid nonprofit to start. And then I would say the confidence came later when I got more students you get more funding, and then you start to see the the impact. It was more of me trying to solve a problem, That's which I awesome. think this is all about. <laughs> start with why, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. You know that that rather famous talk by Simon Sinek, and it, it's so true, isn't it? Right. If you've got a why, then you'll figure out how. Exactly. And just like in a chess game, you need to know what your goal is, and then figure out how to get there. So we've talked a lot about these benefits of chess all the way from the strategic side, the leadership side, the soft skills, public speaking skills and different things that have happened. How critical is it in your experience and in, as you've led groups now and other coaches and worked with many, many students to have a high chess skill in order to gain these life benefits of the game of chess? Mm -hmm. You know, that's such a great question because I see students who might not be as advanced as others over the chessboard, mm -hmm. already using the skills in their day-to-day -day life. And that to me is, is a marker of success. I mean, there are some students who they really know how to problem solve and do tons of chess puzzles. And they really have a key eye for identifying, you know, problems or holes in their opponent's side and coming up with mm -hmm. really great ideas or solutions, yep. but their passion's not competitive chess. Their passion right. is not doing long games. And so I always tell the kids that there's, there's really two paths that you can take. If you want to do the competitive side, that's great. You can yep. do that. And tons of people have been successful with that. And you can uh -huh. still be an advocate for, you know, all the benefits of chess and still yep. be a leader. But the other side, which I find a lot more students are taking just given um, you know, other interests as mm -hmm. it's, you know, come up, especially with, um, with steam and such, yeah. they're interested in, okay, if I do chess, how's it going to help me? And it's a unique thing that I'm able to do, but it just helps me problem solve in different ways. So I would say that you don't need, you know, having the basics of chess is great. Yeah. I find that there's ways that we can connect some of the mm -hmm. openings and tactics to different you know, leadership characteristics, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say you need to be, you know, a Bobby Fisher type player in order to, you know, to, to really gain those skills. I think as long as you, okay. I say to kids, as long as you know how the pieces move, you're already on your way because really that's yeah. the, that's the big part. I mean, you need to know how the pieces move and the basic rules, and then it really goes from there. In, in fact, what's coming to mind as you're talking about this is, would you say that there's a curve mm -hmm. of diminishing return in terms of life benefit versus chess study input. So imagine on this graph, right? The graph on the one side is your chess skill in terms of ranking or, or such. And the graph on the other side is the, shall we say, the life 
benefit that you're getting, the life skills, transferable skills, all these different ones that you're gaining. So in other words, it's, it's almost like saying you need the basics in order to gain these skills, but at a certain point, increasing your, your chess skill, another 200 rating points is not going to add much, if anything, to the life benefit you gain. Now, of course, if you have a dream of pursuing chess and you've set a goal for that and you're pursuing it, now you're building that skill of long-term goal setting and perseverance to the goal, right? Am I on the right track here with what your, what your experience is? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that being a competitive chess player and even look at like Magnus, I mean, mm-hmm. he, he, you know, taking a break. Cause it, it's, mm-hmm. it was described as like, it's, it's draining. Cause you're using it in your brain <laughs> so much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that you're right in that, you know, there's a difference I find between studying chess to be, you know, a really, really competitive player and, and taking it like, you know, football practice, basketball, where you're working on your body, you're working on your brain yep. versus yep. being a scholar of the general study of, of the game. I consider mm-hmm. myself more of broadly an advocate for the game and more of a, of a scholar of its history compared mm-hmm. to, you know, walking into a, a tournament with tons and tons of people and saying, you know, oh, I want to get, you know, first first place. Right. 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 Um, So I do think there's, there's a decision that has to be made there and you can achieve both. But I find that teachers, chess players that become teachers stopped at a point because they were like, you know what, I want to return all of the things that I learned and give it back. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I've got a few more questions before we wrap up. And then would you be open to a fun, quick chess challenge game with me? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. We'll do that after a couple more questions. So in your chess history, whether it's a game or an experience or whatever it was, can you share a favorite moment from all of your chess experiences? I I love that, that question. And there's, there's a lot because I've seen, you Mm -hmm. know, student impacts. Um, I've seen uh, parents, parent impact, all of those great things. But I think the one memory that comes to mind is that we were teaching Um, at a pretty big public school. And this was the first chess club that they ever had had there. I mean, they really didn't have any infrastructure for chess in the past. Students had some interest, but you're going in really cold and and the administrators don't necessarily understand the impact of chess yet. So you have kids for like half an hour during lunch and you're trying to make an impact. And, you know, we had the session for several weeks. And then finally, you know, I always send out uh, surveys to see, okay, what do the students like? What do they want to see more of? And on one of the surveys, you know, all the kids were talking about how they, how, you know, they enjoyed it and they want to keep pursuing it. But one of the surveys said, um, you know, this was the first time that the student had felt like they really belonged in a setting Mm. and they had never felt that way before. And one of the reasons they said why was because they said, you know, it doesn't matter how good I am at at this game. What matters is, is that I can constantly be learning. And that's, I think the most important part. Um, And that's really what we're all about. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, if students, I've have tons of students now who are even better than I am. And I love when that happens because the goal is not, you know, for me to just, I love when students beat me because it's like, it's just, it, you're like, yeah, this is, this is a great thing. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause that's not the, that's, that's awesome. Okay. What, what I heard you say in there too, is basically even in this young student, you saw a growth mindset developing, mm-hmm. right? A willingness to try and continually learn no matter the result, that willingness to fail right? In order to move forward and learn and gain those experiences. So that is, that is really awesome. So um, in terms of chess, and then I have another question, not necessarily chess here. So because of the outcomes and the benefits that you have seen from the game, what would be your dream in terms of chess integration in education? Mm -hmm. You know, I think personally that I love the movement to get chess in schools. I think that it really could be its own, you know, 
subject and something that students are required to take like art athletics because it how much it does with the psychology is it is incredible but i'm actually advocating for more chess in colleges and universities because that is the age where you really are making decisions that are going to completely change the trajectory of your life we expect students when they're 18 to know what they're going to do for the rest of their life right and oftentimes you don't know right so chess can help people get there and i think when we're talking about broadly chess and education we need to remember higher ed and the benefits it can have in that. So that's why I love to focus on higher ed more so for those, you know, young professionals to learn from the kids that we have that are in fifth, sixth grade, and they're building these mentor mentee relationships. Um, chess should be in the schools. It should be in after school settings. I think teachers should, you know, have that background. But I really am passionate about higher ed. And then really, I love the connection between, you know, chess and law. And mm -hmm. um, oftentimes lawyers reach out because they want to have, um, you know, us come to, to their firms to talk to associates about decision making. So I think that it's a skill that could be learned at any age, higher ed, you know, early on professional life, and then looking into businesses and, and corporations. So um, I think when we talk about education broadly, it really should be a part of everyone's life at any age, just because it's a, it's a, it's a mind building tool, right? You're using it to help build a business and, and everything. So I think that broadly is, is how I like to look at it. That's awesome. I completely agree. And you know, you're mirroring some of the things that I've advocated for even more recently to say, chess should be treated as another one of these tools in elementary grade school. You know, you get exposure, like you said, to opportunities for music and art. And even in PE, you have like these eight sports, you know, floor hockey, soccer, all of these different ones, flag football. Why isn't chess treated the same way to expose the benefits to all youth without a barrier of entry, such as having to pay for after school lessons and things? Why isn't it just included as a baseline experience? And those that engage with it can go further if they choose to, mm -hmm. right? And then what you're talking about at the higher ed piece, you know, the college to career, those listening, you'll want to check out an interview we did recently with Florian, who's been the head of chess at Amazon and the work they're doing to map together college to career. And they're getting companies who recognize the benefits that chess has developed to say, hey, we want to sponsor events with chess players because they've been developing the skills that we need. So there's tremendous opportunities that way. And thanks for sharing that, Ashley, your perspective there. So setting aside chess, or maybe it's chess too, <laughs> <laughs> what is a big accomplishment in life that you want to see it achieved maybe in 10 years, maybe it's a lifetime goal, whether it's chess, personal business, whatever it is, what's that big dream of yours? Yes. Uh, I, I love how you frame that. And it really, one of the things that chess helped build in me, but it had always been one of my passions is just youth involvement in tons of different things. So I'm big about the under 25 having a seat at, you know, various tables, whether it be boardrooms, you know, initiatives to get young people on nonprofit and corporate boards. Um, but one thing I'd love to see, really, it could happen in the next five, but probably would take a little bit longer, given um, how for some people, this is like a radical idea, um, is to have, you know, youth more engaged in, in government. So a thing I'm working on now is a White House Youth Policy Council. And anytime people hear, you know, politics, they, they think, oh, it's like, it's a polarizing thing. But no, what politics needs more of is young people who have the skills that we were just talking about. And young people are building those skills because there's organizations like yours that are teaching those skills. And so young people are growing and becoming more able to collaborate to problem solve than really adults. So looking at um, a youth policy council in the White House to help advise the president on policies is so important because it's it's not you know a partisan thing. It's we're looking at problems in a way that holistically, right on both sides. And that's where we're going to come up with data-driven responses. So that's what I'd love to see soon and um, 
I say it's going to take longer because for some people, having young people in those positions is is scary, <laughs> and it shouldn't be. <laughs> that's that's fascinating and awesome, and and I would just say kudos and go for it, right? Because like we know, many mainstream ideas start out as radical ideas just because it's not yet mainstream, right? But it takes someone with a vision to drive mm-hmm. that forward and work through it and make a plan and, and move forward. And, and I like what you're talking about from the aspect of we live in this world that's so rapidly changing. Why not talk to the people who were born and raised in that world? Yes. Because if the only ideas you have are those who were pre that kind of world, then aren't we missing a piece of the conversation? Exactly. Exactly. You could be a spokesperson. Uh, Well, you know what? I love looking forward. I love learning from the past, but not living in the past. Right. I love moving forward. So before we get to our chess game, what I have one final question. What advice now that you've gone through what you've done already, would you give your younger self, let's say 10 years ago, now Mm -hmm. that you are where you are? You know, I think that, and and this is something I think you and I have talked about, um, sometimes there's so much focus on on trying to fix systems that can't be fixed or don't want to have new ideas. And (laughs) sometimes you just got to start your own thing and focus on what you're building. And that's an advice that you had given me in, in different things that I had struggled with because I was trying so hard to really push new ideas and initiatives in a certain you know, place and, and it, they just weren't having it. And so it's better to, you know, you have an idea, foster it, grow it. You can create a community of people and it can become really big and powerful. You don't need existing structures to, to make it happen. Love that. Basically the willingness to go out and do something new if needed. And I do remember that conversation from about (laughs) four plus or so years ago, or whatever it was, timing doesn't really matter, but the concept Agreed. There's times when leveraging existing resources makes the most sense as the path towards a vision. There's other times it takes a new path, Mm -hmm. right? And the willingness to go out and try those new paths and not saying we always have to follow what was there is is a great skill. And again, back to the growth mindset, right? (laughs) That's awesome. So we're going to go to a chess game here in a sec. Remember, everybody listening, remember to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on the amazing conversations and the people we meet from around the world using chess in their lives, their communities to make a positive impact. And now, Ashley, you ready for a fun chess challenge? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, that's awesome. Give me a sec here. I'm going to share my screen just so people can see the game as we play it. And like we say at Chess for Life, and as we always do, you can win, you can draw, or we can learn okay here we are share my screen there it is everybody should be able to see the board and it looks like you're playing the light pieces you get to go first and go ahead and for those of you watching this is a five minute challenge so that means the pressure's on five minutes for all of our moves for the whole game and normally especially with young students, we're saying slow down. If you see a good move, look for a better one. Here you add that pressure of time. And sometimes in life, you have to make a decision because time is a component. So then you have to be willing and comfortable making decisions with limited knowledge, right? You don't want to make hasty choices, but sometimes you just have to get comfortable making a decision with the information you have and then do the best you can with it. And so, yeah, one thing that I want to ask you as we're doing this is some people don't really understand or value um, speed chess as a way to, to learn chess. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are, because I think that it actually helps people make decisions in somewhat of a quicker fashion, but I'm curious what your thoughts I, are. I'm so glad you asked that, Ashley, because when I was younger, I loved speed chess, but some people called it (laughs) anti-chess. It was like, you're building a bad habit of moving fast. And I've reflected on that over time. And eventually I came to the realization there's a time and a place for all these things. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, I find that 
speed chess develops certain skills of focus, concentration, rapid problem solving, that if you only play long chess, you may lack. I've seen people who can play great long games who under pressure make really poor decisions that they would actually not make if they weren't under pressure. And so I think building that skill of making decisions under some pressure like time is an amazing skill to build. And speaking of, I should focus on what do I do here? <laughs> Ashley's moved her pawn forward. My queen is here. I'm trying to get my pieces out. I'm trying to attack the center of the board here. There's a lot of tactics in this position already. And so making a choice under pressure is something I've got to do right now. What do we do? Let's do the capture. Sometimes releasing the tension simplifies, but it can also be dangerous because simplifying may or may not be in, in one's advantage, to one's advantage. Have we ever played before? I don't know if you and I have like played. You, you know, that is a great point. I don't <laughs> think we ever have. <laughs> this is, I think, our first game. <laughs> Even though we've interacted and as we supported your work in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, in the schools there. And for those um, watching and listening in, I want to say that playing a match with me, you know, I'm a national master in the game of chess. Mm -hmm. I studied a very hard, was high school state champion. Uh, Ashley did not pursue chess to that same degree. So for her readiness to just jump in and say, I'm up for a game, right? <laughs> you can see how she lives out the growth mindset. She's not afraid to take on a challenge, whether it's a win or a learn. And I applaud that. I've seen that over the years with you. Yeah. And I think partly it's because you learn so much more when you are playing people who are better than you, right? And yep. so taking on the, the opportunity, I'm gonna lose my yep. night there. Um, taking on the opportunity is, is important because you're learning even more skills um, and really building some of the things that you, that you need to build in order to be a 100% agreed, 100%. In fact, when I was younger, we did not have the resources to pay for professional coaches for me. And so I just read lots and lots of books. And in some ways, I like to say, while I had no coaches, I also had hundreds of coaches. Because every single game I played, I tried to learn from my opponents. What is it I could have done better? How could I have improved? What could I have done? And so I learned from just everybody I played. And it was an amazing experience, both meeting people and learning from them and building friendships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, you asked me about advice to my younger self. What's something that, you know, advice that you would give your younger self now that you've built this, you know, amazing organization? Thank you for turning the question on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I no longer can qualify for your under 25 group, even though I feel like it many times, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for 20 years, I've been on this path of using chess as a vehicle for developing life benefits and life skills through the game of chess. And I kind of fell into it. Mm -hmm. And when I look back on my 20 years of doing this and working with different companies and presenting on the benefits and seeing students grow up and what would I do differently in my own life? I'm going to start with something that I did that I would emulate and re recommend for everybody. And that is from a teenager on. Whenever I met somebody who I found, I, I looked up to in some way, I saw something in their life that was like, oh, that's amazing. How did they achieve that? Especially if it was intimidating to me, because I was the shy kid originally. I would get out of my comfort zone and I would reach out my hand and say hello. And then if I had a little bit of a conversation, I would ask if they would be willing to take a few minutes sometimes, sit down and share their story with me of how they achieved that thing that I so respected about them. Mm -hmm. I met dozens of amazing individuals that I learned so much from. Yes. 
And if I would give myself, that's the positive side. Now, if I were to give myself the advice to my younger self, I would say as early as possible, get over the fear of losing. Yes. There were, there were plenty of times where I didn't reach out and, and ask, and what did I miss? You know, I look back on it and I don't live in the past. I look forward. I look at the progress. I don't look at what I've lost. You know, I think that's an important mindset to live in. Uh, but if I were to give advice and I give this advice regularly to others is if you feel this little bit of like, a, oh, I'm a little bit afraid, press into it, build that courage, pursue it. you never know what you may learn. And otherwise, what might you miss out? Yes. Right? What's the worst that could happen? Somebody says no. So what? <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, thank you for asking the question, though. It's, I, I love reflecting on that and figuring out how to get better. Yeah, and and I I always been had been wanting to ask you that because I think, uh, you know, we have that same mindset where it's like you should reach out to people. I mean, the worst thing that they can do is to say, you know, no, I don't have enough time. But oftentimes, people will reach out because they want reach back out because they want to hear from from younger people and and support and help. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's an important, you know piece of mm -hmm. it. In fact, while you're saying that, one of the things I've noticed is in the many, many individuals I've met, it seemed as if the more successful the person, mm -hmm. the more they were willing to help. Yes. It seemed like there was this phase mm -hmm. where people were kind of pretending to be successful yes. when they had like this mm -hmm. chip on the shoulder and weren't willing to. And ultimately I came to recognize, you know what, what are the traits what are the character traits of true achievers and my belief is some of that boils down to a skill we teach in chess or strive to called better together where it's this recognition of the unique abilities right the unique strengths just like chess pieces move different ways so people in life have different strengths and it's this recognition that i'm no better than someone else even if i have a stronger skill in some particular area and so let me look at every person I meet, you, every person I've interviewed, my students, they have something amazing I can learn from. Absolutely. And, and here we are having a great chat and we have a time control that says if we run out of time, we lose the match. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's uh, easy to find suboptimal moves in the midst of a conversation. <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> so speaking of, let's speed up here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have tons of opportunities here. Exactly. And we found a checkmate. Good game. Thank you, Ashley. Good game yourself. You know, that was fun to finally actually play you a match. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Ashley, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to join me on the Chess for Life Spotlight. You know, it's a pleasure to catch up. You've been such an energetic, right, what, catalyst <laughs> in your community, always striving to solve problems, right? Make the world better find solutions, think strategically. So I really loved our conversation about these life skill benefits and some of these unique ones. I hadn't even really thought about that one in particular about, you mentioned the public speaking act aspect of it. And I was like, wow, that is so true. And yet I rarely have ever talked about that one. So thank you for the conversation. Everybody listening, once again, remember to like and subscribe in order to learn about more of these amazing stories. And Ashley, where can people follow the great work that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so I'd say the best resource to start is our website, uh, tqgchess.institute. Uh, and uh, there, you know, we have um, blog, YouTube channel, social media, but really if you reach out, we'd love to, you know, love to hear from you and, and to connect. Awesome. We'll be sure to post that and any other links that would be relevant 
in the comments, in, in the blog, in our posts. So thank you, Ashley, once again, a pleasure connecting. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.